My name is Danny Panzella, and I asked to introduce Assam because not only is he a fellow New Yorker, but he has been a personal inspiration to me in my activism. So many of you know me that uh, we, I've done cop blocking, and uh, now we've kind of changed up the strategy with Peaceful Streets Project in New York City, uh, holding the police accountable for the things like uh, drones that Assam has brought to the national stage, uh, in large part his work. And uh, he really inspired us and some of the, the activists down in New York City to kind of imitate what he was doing and create posters about other uh, issues as well. Like, uh, NYPD is going to be introducing body scanners on the streets, where they're going to be driving up and down and just scanning people as they walk up and down the streets with no consent at all. So uh, that's an issue that I'm very uh, active and passionate about, and I just wanted to introduce Hassan because he has been, a, his activism has been an inspiration to me. So he is an, a photo artist, is that the correct term? Photographer. He's a photographer and an artist, a graphic artist as well. Uh, he served in the military and I guess it was your time in the military that made you kind of sensitive to some of these issues like the U.S. use of drones and uh, that's what inspired this line of art. So without further ado, Hassan. Thank you all for being here. First off, I want to thank the Liberty Forum for having me. It's really an honor to be here in front of this group of people, especially as an artist, to be considered somebody that sticks up for liberty and has the same ideology. I really appreciate it because it is something that means something to me. And honestly, I didn't know the Free State Project existed or the Liberty Forum existed until I got an email asking me if I would speak. So, um, if you don't mind, I would like to start by showing you a video. Um, that sort of introduces and sort of gives some context to what I'm going to be talking about for the next little bit. Interesting little read here. And now something that made us go, hmm. It's a sign notifying the public that drone activity is in effect. And there is what appears to be a street sign that basically says, Attention, authorized drone strike zone, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. This one we found on Mercer Street says, Local statutes enforced by drone. We were obviously pretty disturbed about it, and we called the NYPD. It turns out that sign was not real. It was actually the work of a local artist who wanted to remain unnamed. Well, for me, it's really about creating a conversation about the possibility of the NYPD authorizing drones to fly in the sky domestically. He's making a political statement about surveillance and the police state that we're living in. Who could feel safe with a drone watching them while they're in their backyard? Not only are they surveillance vehicles, but they are militarized. In other words, they are weapons. We have to remember that these are devices right now internationally are being used to kill people. The Jonas Brothers are here, they're out there somewhere. Sasha and Malia are huge fans, but uh, boys don't get any ideas. I have two words for you, predator drones. You will never see it come. You think I'm joking? Drone strike that killed Awalaki's 16-year-old son, Abdul Rahman Awalaki, 
That 16-year-old, also a U.S. citizen. In essence, Americans were executed by the U.S. government, but there was no public court proceeding, no public presentation of evidence. After promising to reign in executive power, Obama has arguably expanded presidential authority. The ACLU and other groups have sort of pointed out if a Republican president had done this, there would be much more of an outcry. You can't expect to fight terrorism abroad when your country is being a terrorist. drones that can tase or shoot a person from the sky and can even launch a grenade. Is this the next phase of the police state where cops can play video games with our civil liberties and with our lives? They are used in war zones for surveillance and military strikes, but there are plans to deploy drones in the Big Apple. The Montgomery County Sheriff's Office is getting a drone. Yeah! The chief deputy there reportedly has not ruled out putting weapons on his drone. High-resolution cameras can capture every detail, including faces and license plate numbers. Last month, the ACLU issued a 16-page report citing the growth of the use of drones and the lack of laws protecting citizens from airborne intrusions. We see this trend throughout the history of military technology always coming to the civilian world. The age-old philosophy of fear controls people. They're able to do whatever they want as long as we're afraid. The federal government is establishing a police state cameras everywhere, reading our emails, listening to our phone calls, and now shoot you in your backyard if they don't like what you're doing. You might as well live in Havana. We've obviously seen a little bit of press in the last year due to street signs that I was involved with about the NYPD authorizing drones to fly in skies domestically. I think we should be talking about whether that's technology we want to bring to this country. Well, a New York artist has just been arrested for a series of posters he designed. This was something that actually got forensic teams and counter-terrorist officials involved. They finally found out who he was and he did get arrested for this. According to the New Yorker, those bogus NYPD warning signs were put up by a former Iraq war veteran who operated army drones during the war and objects to their use by civilian police. I love that there's someone out there that's fighting against, uh, you know, these drone strikes, that's uh, fighting against the surveillance, the police state that we're living in right now. It, it's inspiring. But if the drones were watching and they helped catch a terrorist or a murderer, would we be okay with the drones then? Weaponized drones that we use to murder American citizens without due process coming to New York City, I'm not sure I'm cool with that. But we're not having that conversation, so that's what I'm here to say. Freeesom.com is where you can go to support the cause, um, and I hope I didn't offend anybody. Um, Mark Twain, in the beginning of a change, the patriot is a scarce man, brave, hated, and scorned. When his cause succeeds, however, the timid join him, for then it costs nothing to be a patriot. That quote has meant something to me in the last year, it meant something, to me, something different to me a year ago than it does now. Um, and I feel honored to be amongst a group of people that probably consider themselves patriots, as do I. And that's why I'm here, because I believe I am a patriotic American. And I believe in the founding, the founding principles <coughs> of this nation. And I'm sure, as do all of you. And I believe in like, an America where innovation isn't stifled by taxation and regulation, but moreover, an America where our most basic constitutional liberties are embraced and not suppressed, like is obviously happening. 
Um, and it's my personal story and the journey that I've been on over the course of the last year that brings me here to the stage and is a demonstration of an America that I believe has lost its way from the America that our founders envisioned. What I'd like to share with you today are some of my ideas on change and a little bit of my story and also a little bit of my ideas on creating change in a free and open society. My journey as an artist began when I made the decision to join the U.S. Army. Um, it was in order to fund my education and to pursue what at the time was my dream to be a photographer. My military experience, though at the time the farthest thing from expected of me, was tantamount in creating the artist I am today. Yeah, you can ask my mother about that. <laughs> um, the military opened my eyes to corruption and inefficiencies in government that I wouldn't have been exposed to otherwise. And actually, through being here, I've met a lot of people that are a part of this community that once were in government and sort of saw the same things. The military, or when I was in Iraq, I was witnessed civilian contractors doing jobs the military was perfectly trained and equipped to do at nearly 10 times the cost, all in the taxpayer dollar, obviously. I saw the media misrepresenting our involvement in the war and misreporting on the major events of the war. And I watched as soldiers would come home damaged for life by repeated damaged for life by repeated exposure to wartime conditions to be completely neglected by the government. And of course, throughout this experience, I managed for, to do what for me was the most difficult aspect of it all, and that was to maintain the mental strength. <coughs> to filter information and stay true to my ideology and my belief structure, which I believe I share with all of you. And at 23 years old, it was only about 30 days after returning from my second tour of duty, I found myself in New York City, beginning my art education. And New York City, for those of you who know, I don't know who's been, is really a place where the majority are completely obsessed with the here and the now and very detached from America's international involvements. And that sort of, that state of mass hypnosis, if you will, left me really disconnected from the population, but inspired me to become more knowledgeable and more aware of my surroundings and current events. It was in 1782 when Thomas Jefferson said, every government degenerates when trusted to the rulers of the people alone. The people themselves, therefore, are its only safe depositories. And wherever the people are informed, only then can they be trusted with their own government. The Founding Fathers understood the power of information and the importance of education. And I understood that as a member of this society, it was my duty to stay informed and knowledgeable. For in a republic, if the individual doesn't take responsibility for the conditions surrounding them, who else will? Give me two seconds, I'd like to show some work. This PowerPoint thing wasn't working out. So, over the course of my uh, photographic education and photographic career, my, my work began to critique what I saw as flaws in our society. Um, this naturally being complacency or sloth, if you want to take it to the seven deadly sins level. <laughs> Mediocrity. <laughs> so proud of that C+. Plus. <laughs> he really just doesn't care. <laughs> American apathy. I'm half Egyptian, um, and I travel to Egypt quite often, so I was very aware, or at least tried to be, I'm not nearly as aware as I have family there that are living that revolution, living the problems that that country is going through. And I would talk to them on the phone and via Skype, and, and then I would live my daily life and there's an entire region of the world that's like in complete upheaval, and we don't care at all. Um, ubiquitous identity, Magritte inspired. Sorry. I 
appear to have frozen. Anyway, point being, all this work actually, this is a good place to start, is, um, was really inspired by the Surrealist movement and artists like Max Ernst and Marcel Duchamp, Rene Magritte in this instance. Um, these men were obsessed with the contextual relationships between people and objects and events and how human understanding is really all altered through context. I also drew inspiration from literary minds like Albert Camus, who like our founders believed that he, like every artist and everyone really, had a duty to society and its progress through creation and action. When I first stumbled upon the possibility of drones being used domestically, I was A, shocked, having known what they've been doing internationally for a few years now. And, and I also sort of thought the me media would have a field day with this. <laughs> Naturally, that was not the case. Um, it would, I think, solidify what maybe wasn't a complete transition at the time into an Orwellian state, but I think maybe we've sort of arrived there now. But of course, much to my dismay, the media didn't talk about it at all. And it wasn't until I was pointed in the direction of a very obscure news source called the Gay City News, which is a free paper handed, handed out on the sidewalks of New York City. And they were the only, the only media outlet to do a Freedom of Information Act request that revealed the NYPD was communicating with the FAA on the legality of using drones over the skies of New York. It was sort of at that point where I realized a conversation needed to take place. Nobody was covering this except for some paper that people used to line their birdcage. <clears throat> and that's when I came up with what you saw in that video with the drone signs. I would like to show you more pictures, but this appears to be frozen, so I apologize. Um, the drone signs were my sort of authoritarian state street signs, right? Warning people that drone activity is in progress, authorized drone strike zone, things of the like. Is it working now? All right, we're good. Okay, maybe I can go back and show these. So this was sort of my media hegemony photograph. Ideological exchange. Instruments of tyranny. Financial manipulation. A lot of Ayn Rand readers here. I like that. <laughs> um, heinous criminals their upbringing. <laughs> I call this Ben Bernanke, age three months. <laughs> and blindly following the leader. These are my street signs. Local statues enforced by drone, that's in Dumbo. Here we have the authorized drone strikes on in front of the Guggenheim on 5th <laughs> Avenue. Is that 8 a.m. to 8 p.m.? 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. People including Sunday. God does not care. In front of the United Nations. <laughs> And here's one in front of George Washington in Washington Square Park. <laughs> um, the point, naturally, was, well, for me, the point was to use sort of the most monotonous means of communication that the government uses to communicate information and create a form of cognitive dissonance in a viewer where you look at something that you expect a really silly, mundane message and you're a little shocked and you have to think about what that message that you're actually reading is. And I think I created that, hopefully. Um, such as in this woman. This woman was staged, of course. Um, in conjunction with these street signs, or some of them, I uh, also put up quotes from the Founding Fathers. This is a quote. Where an excess of power prevails, property of no sort is duly respected. No man is safe in his opinions, his person, his faculties, or his possessions. James Madison. Sounds familiar, right? Like, I kind of feel that way, especially having been arrested for 
ideas. This quote, the Republican is the only form of government which is not eternally at open or secret war with the rights of mankind, Thomas Jefferson. This quote gets mis misunderstood in New York City especially all the time because people think the Republican Party, but naturally we're talking about the Republican form of government, right? Each of these quotes related to freedom, liberty, and the nature of government in some way, shape, or form. All in all, my goal was to create a, des a conversation about the domestic and international use of drones, predominantly domestic though, because that's not something we were talking about. And only 20 days after the installment of the first street sign, the New Yorker picked up the story. And then it ran nationally. Seemingly for me a success. And of course one day, I was out having drinks with some friends, celebrating what I thought was a job well done, and I receive a phone call from a close friend. We need to talk immediately. I was a little worried, so naturally I obliged. And I was shown an email when I met at a bar downtown somewhere, I met at a bar, I was shown an email that was sent by a detective from the NYPD's Bureau of Counterterrorism, and it instructed the Homeowners Association security firms, commercial property owners, and hotels, all to check their property for my signs and, and report any <coughs> evidence or surveillance video footage to the NYPD to help capture the criminal at large. Naturally, I was stunned. And shortly thereafter, the same advisory was public, published in the New York Post, which is New York City's sort of media arm of their state, right? Now it seems assigning the Bureau of Counterterrorism to investigate this case, you know, is a bit authoritarian, but then again, that's what the street signs suggest, and they sort of prove that right. And this is especially true since this sort of force and these resources have not been implemented in hunting down other artists that work in the same manner, like Jordan Seeler, Russell King, John Locke, to name but a few. This overreac overreaction to artistic political speech was eerily similar to what I thought happened to the dutiful actions of people like Thomas Drake, Julian Assange, and even in Nazi times, Sophie Scholl. Let's hope I don't get the guillotine. Um, at this point, I was really spooked, right? I was spooked, A, by that it don't, took only 20 days for what I thought was like something I would have to work on for a year to reach national media coverage. And also spooked that I was be me, being uh, investigated as a suspected terrorist. I decided to hang my hat for a while, needless to say. But then over time, the story faded, drones were drifting from the news, and legislation was passed opening American skies to over 30,000 drones by the year 2015. To me, that signified the conversation wasn't complete, and it didn't have a great enough effect. Thus, my work was not finished. Because I believe, for with freedom comes responsibility, and as long as I am unhappy with the circumstances surrounding my, me, it is my duty as a member of the society to participate in creating change. I took the next few months to mull these ideas over, and I came up with this, which you saw in the video, and I call the drone campaign. I was drawing inspiration from Banksy, who's a very well-known street artist, obviously public service announcements, even the iPod, and those ads I'm sure you all remember. I again set out to create that same sense of cognitive dissonance in the viewer. Here's a vertical version. This time, though, in a slightly more whimsical way, obviously satirical. Though still under the guise of propaganda from the police state, right, or the authoritarian state. I have another video, if you don't mind. Very sorry about this.
I don't know if this is going to work. I'm sorry. It shouldn't should work in media player. It's got to work in a, in a uh, different program. Can mobile to them will be This is what I get for coming with multimedia to show. <laughs> The interview that I want to show is an interview that the Animal New York did on, uh, of me. It was an anonymous interview. I was blacked out to sort of disguise my identity because still, at, at this point, I was still a criminal at large, and I knew the NYPD was after me. The other dot MOV played though. Yeah, it's an MOV. I know, but the other that I know, the first video that I played. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's only 4K. It's only 4K. That's not actual. It's only 4K. It's only 4K. It's only 4K. It's only 4K. Sorry about this, guys. No, no, it's okay. That's all right. Anyway, so the interview, I really sort of, I wanted to show it because it really illustrated in, a, in like great detail how I went about doing that project. Um, if I can bring PowerPoint back up and show sort of these signs. We went out in the dark of night. I, did about, I had about a hundred of these ads printed on professional styrene, which is the medium in which the advertising companies print their ads. It took me about four, four months to sort of plan logistically for the job. I went out and put paper versions of similar sort of, sort of ads around the city, waited to see their like replacement schedule, to see how long like I wanted to figure out how I could get the best like viewership, right? I wanted them to be up for the longest amount of time. Turns out they replace them once a month, so I go out the day after they replace them and put mine in. <laughs> so I can get them up for a month, theoretically. I go out with a team. We're dressed up like construction workers. We, uh, so we look official. I get a van. It's decked out with Van Wagner. It's got the, Van Wagner is the ad company that owns the space and sells it to the, the agencies trying to, uh, to advertise. So I get a white van. <laughs> Put the Van Wagner logos on it, and you know I wear a construction vest, tool belt, and a cordless drill. I obviously figure out what kind of bit I need to open that door, and I go out with a buddy, and I also bring security. So not only am I in this van that's decked out and looks official, so nobody looks twice, but I know the cops are on my case. You know, there's a chance that they might find out or might be looking for somebody doing something like this. So I have two guys on scooters, Vespas, nice. both with earpieces, communicating with me, <laughs> letting me know what's going on around. And then my buddy also that's helping me is listening to the police scanner. So it's, you know, yeah. an operation and very much informed by my time in the military and sort of being as efficient <laughs> as humanly possible, right? I want to do this, I want to do it right, and I don't want to go to jail. I did not achieve that last goal. <laughs> the point of the project was not only to instigate conversation in the subject, but also really to illustrate how over the course of the last hundred years or so, our nation really has seen this authoritarian state transition through. Um, the NYPD has obviously demonstrated this with my arrest as well as Congress demonstrating this with the Patriot Act and the National Defense Authorization Act. And Obama has demonstrated this with his covert drone campaign. And, I mean, so our nation has really resorted to force in, in large part, right? Altering its laws to, to have a militarized approach to basically all its problems, both foreign and domestic. 
our military industrial complex has affected you know, local police forces as well as even the IRS. Um, it was Alexander Hamilton that said, the instruments by which government must act are either the authority of laws or force. If the first be destroyed, the last must be substituted. Where this becomes the ordinary instrument of government, there is an end to liberty. So how do we recover from this, you may ask? Well, I'd like to use the words of an anonymous monk. Passed away some time ago. <laughs> When I was young, I wanted to change the world. I found it was difficult to change the world, so I tried to change the nation. When I found I couldn't change the nation, I began to focus on my town. I couldn't change the town, so I tried to change my family. Now that I am older, I realize that the only thing I can change is myself. And suddenly I realized that if long ago I had changed myself, I could have made an impact on my family. My family and I could have made an impact on our town, and their impact could have changed the nation, and I could indeed have changed the world. We all like to criticize our representatives, we like to complain about our nation, and we like to contem condemn our politics and policies. But it's my belief that I have a duty, a duty as an artist, and each and every one of us has that same duty as a citizen to embody the change we desire to see in our surroundings. For if we do nothing to take responsibility for our society, who will? We've seen our government do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, that's really too much. Um, and obviously I would love to open this up to open dialogue since that's what I was set out to create. So if anybody has any questions or comments. Yes? So what was the website that you said um, where we can send something and if I don't like to use things online, how else can I send some financial aid to you? Well, so I'm having a front reserve. I didn't really, t I guess I can talk a little bit about what I'm facing. I was arrested right in my home, as the video mentioned. Um, they had a search warrant, they were hunting me. It turns out they had, sorry, I'll get to your question, just giving a little backstory. Um, they, had a, they had eyes on me for months. They watched me do that last project, photographed it so they can use that evidence against me when they finally like, decided to come to my apartment. There's a fundraiser. The website is www.freeesam.com. That's three E's, S-S-A-M. Um, and you can donate via PayPal. I'm going to try to maybe get Bitcoin on there now. I love that idea. Just found out about these guys today. Love it. Um, what about conventional money? Because that's all I have right now. <laughs> what I, I'll probably put a P.O. box up there. That, there isn't one up yet, but I'll probably put a P.O. box that somebody can send a check to. Um, some money in these bras. But I'm also having, <laughs> there is a fundraiser, and there's an event on March 14th. So there's going to be like six bands playing and a very large live art auction. The auction will be online as well, so if anybody, if you check the website within the course of the next two weeks, all that work will be up on the website and you can bid online. There'll be an eBay store and, you know, the, obviously the proceeds will to pay my legal fees, which are quite daunting. Um, I am facing three felonies and two misdemeanors for this artwork. Uh, what's that? I said you miscreant. What about a Pulitzer <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready for that. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so New Yorkers are walking by these things that they're ignoring them largely and just they, they don't see them? And I mean, I think the video in the beginning illustrated that that wasn't the case, right? I mean, it was on CNN, for God's sake. Aaron Burnett covered it. That means people were paying attention and people were shocked, right? <laughs> but, but, but weren't you lurking around and, and looking at what people were doing and watching them? Not really. To be honest, after I did that first project, I mostly just forgot. I didn't forget about it. I just let it go. I didn't really know how to check. I put up 50 of the street signs 
about 20 of the quotes and a hundred and some, like 110 or so of the uh, drone campaign ads. <laughs> and check on the progress and then obviously, duh, Google, right? My cousin calls me and he's like, I just Googled NYPD drone campaign or drone ads or signs and like there was this litany of articles and I was like, oh my God. And so that's sort of, that's sort of how I kept up with it. I didn't, really, and I'll, I didn't really go out and like sit by the signs. I would go out occasionally and check on them and I would notice that they were quickly coming down. The subject matter was abrasive, NYPD didn't like it, so they took them down as quickly as they could. There's a similar project in the works, actually. <laughs> or at least brewing. <laughs> yes? I live in New York City, and so I've admired your work for a while. <clears throat> I remember seeing the stencils of the Founding fathers first, and, and walking by, like doing a double take, like mm -hmm. that. There's this like sort of, you know, libertarian leaning, like, like who's doing like graffiti art? The founding fathers, right? It's amazing. Right. Um, and uh, but by the way, there's also a, a Bradley Manning thing at like North Bedford and Nassau where they meet in Williamsburg. Okay, that's, that's not you, is it? No. Oh, okay. I'm just curious. It has a, some little Somebody stuff. spray painted a uh, traitor over it. Oh, really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. That's disappointing. Well, it just illustrates how to close my eyes. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I actually walked by the uh, the drone at first without noticing it mm -hmm. one day. Just, you know, cause in New York, you like, don't pay attention to stuff, right? And I walked by and see this NYPD ad and then walked by later on that day and I'm like, you know, this is amazing. Like, what's going on here? So, it, like, I just think it's brilliant. Thank you for doing that. Um, Thank you. My question, I'll say, uh, it, it, there's a, an NYU student who started um, tweeting every reported drone strike from like 10 years ago. I don't know if you've, if you've heard of this. I mean, I have. I'm not following him. I only just recently became sort of public with my, since my arrest sure, with sure. my like support of like anti-drone, you know, whatever, whether it be Instagram or tweets or things like that. But I just because I was trying to be anonymous for a long time. This is actually my first public appearance. So. <laughs> You want to answer my question though? But he had discovered this sort of disturbing trend of something called the double tap, a double strike, yeah. or whatever. Do you have you heard of that? Even? I, I've heard of it. I don't know how the military it's used. About it we didn't really. I mean, trend. it's been going on for years. It's not a disturbing trend. It's the typical uh, SOP for the military. The, yeah. I don't know. Okay. I didn't work extensively with drones. I worked. I was a geospatial analyst, and what I did was, you know, make maps for the troops on the ground. So occasionally we would request drone imagery if a drone was in the neighborhood. At the time, we have to remember that they were just being used, or I mean, I have to remember that they were just being used as surveillance, right? There was an eye in the sky, troops on the ground. When I was in Iraq, there was only three of them. It was a brand new technology. It was like the cool thing in, on campus at the time. So, yes? Um, what, what took the cops off when you first started out? Because said, you said they were surveilling you for a month. So I think what happened was I did the street signs and then it was maybe two weeks after I get an email from Nick Palmgarten of The New Yorker and he wanted to interview me and he's actually even more intense than I am like anti-robot war and um, so he wanted to write a story in the talk of the town piece of The New Yorker so I interviewed with him obviously keeping my identity quasi-secret, I think they were able to piece together from the few facts that that article gave away yeah. who I was, because then, you know, maybe three months after that, they started tracking me and they, they were following me. I only had this information through my lawyer who sat down with the DA and was showing my lawyer photographs from a car of me putting up the drone ads. Do you think your name had any, anything to do with exacerbating their... Uh... Oh, I'm sure it did. I'm sure it did. Especially how they treat, you know, people of Islamic or, you know, Muslim descent in New York City. They're spying on them constantly. Yes, in the back. Was the forged instrument charge your drill bit, and was the weapons charge your drill? <laughs> <laughs> so the charges, um, I guess I'll give you a rundown of all of them. Grand larceny, people are always confused. It's for taking the ad space, the ads out of the ad space. Yeah. So there were existing ads in those phone booths that I removed, so grand larceny, because they were worth more than $1,000, apparently. Um, and then I was charged with possession of stolen property, which is that same 
the same ends. So yeah. it seems a little bit like double jeopardy, but I guess not. Um, the forged instrument charge is the NYPD logo that was on all of them. Oh. It's 56 counts, which I don't know where they got that number. I'm glad it's not the 110 yeah, that I did. <laughs> um, right? And the weapons charge, I have an antique revolver that was made in 1892. Totally legal to have, doesn't work, doesn't even take ammunition that's made anymore. Um, they found it naturally in my apartment and they're claiming that it's an illegal firearm. Oh, uh, yeah. So, that's that. <laughs> Any other questions? Bring in the NRA. Soon. <laughs> yes, in the back against the wall? Yeah. I wonder how you feel, personally, about taking down an ad and putting your thing up. Just separate from everything, anything else that you do. I just wonder how you feel about that. I mean, most of the advertising is like for pharmaceuticals. Like, of course, I'm okay taking it down. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, you, you cited an artistic tradition that inspired you as an artist. Did, do, you, do you find any uh, sort of, I don't know, um, you know, precursors to this kind of activism in any of the? I mean, I, I think of Dada and uh, you know, surrealists as being essentially intellectual. Uh, mm. Did it ever? go into some of this obedience? And not in my inspiration, no. Like, my inspiration for them, like, as, like the, the sort of Rebus-style photographs and the contextual relationship between objects is sort of the inspiration that I drew from them. I am not, and I've never really considered myself an activist, and I still don't. I, 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 I yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I'm being told. Um, <laughs> So no, I guess is the answer to the question. Um, I do appreciate sort of the thought-provoking aspect of it. And if it happens to draw attention to malfeasance in government, all the better, right? Sir? I, I love that, <laughs> considering they're using drones for patrolling the border as well, I love the silhouette <laughs> in there is from the signs that they Absolutely. on the side of the road to warn people that immigrants might be running across the road and to not hit them. Right. And that you can see these in Southern California and, and uh, border cool. states in the South. Part of why I took that was because of that, and also the, the reappropriation of that image that Banksy, Banksy had used that image as well in a few pieces, so. Yes, Jim? I sort of have two questions. One is like with NDAA, and since they used the counterterrorism unit to come and hunt you down, are you concerned about that? Is the first question like being taken in indefinitely under that whole mess? And two, how do you stay sane with that kind of threat looming over you? Whether that you're thinking of that, but even just having all of these things like sitting on your shoulders. Yes, I am, but to a pretty minute degree. Um, I'm fairly confident that it's not the feds that are chasing me, it's the NYPD, which is a state issue. Now, the NYPD is the seventh largest military force in the world, so it's a pretty strong entity and one that I shouldn't really poke too much, right? But I don't think that they have the ability to black bag me. And if they do, well... We'll come get you! <laughs> now you all know, so... <laughs> Yes, sir. I was just wondering where you um, got the phrase protection when you least expect it um, that was on one of those the posters. I don't know. I, it came, I wrote down a bunch of things. I sort of brainstormed a few ideas and then that sort of stuck out. I just sort of sat with a notepad and was writing. <coughs> and, and then like I mulled it over for a few days and asked my friends and see what has the best effect, you know, send some emails. So it's a process a little bit. But. Any other questions? Your friends that helped you? No, they tried to threaten to when they wanted to interview me and I wasn't speaking, but no, none of my friends have been have been prosecuted. Yes? So do you have certain political leanings or you said you've never heard of like Project or anything? Or I mean I've definitely 
I definitely align myself with the libertarian ideology. I just I hadn't heard of this this organization up until I was invited to it, and I love it. I've had a great time here. I, mean, I was here all day listening to the talks and all day today, and it's been great. And a really like beautiful community. So thank you for having me. <laughs> Again, yeah. Why is that? I don't. I have to. Oh, you got it. Oh, I'll have to look into it. For sure. Thank you. Yes, sir. You have heard of libertarians, though. Obviously. Yes. And I've voted for Ron Paul the last two cycles. Yeah. Yeah. In the back, yes? Come to the event. Have a good time. Let's make this like, yeah, it's in New York, unfortunately. So. All right. Yes, sir. Are you expecting some sort of uh, police representation at the, uh, the opening? It wouldn't surprise me one bit. They, Look for the earpieces. If, if you were to Google, up until today, actually, if you were to Google free ESOM, when the, first, when the website first went up, it was the first web result. Then a week later, it disappeared. Doesn't come up at all. Pages, 30 pages you can go through. And to me, that was very strange. Like, it's all Wikipedia. With the whole algorithm that is getting results was giving really bizarre results. Finally, I think because there's been enough hits, it's come back on to the, the, like, the search results. But I kind of feel like they're watching and sort of tried to shut it down. But it, didn't, but it didn't work. So there's awareness, at least now. Thank you guys.